Hello YouTube family, James Green, Short Series Shenanigans. So this is the next episode in the, the making of the fixture plates. So anyway, I posted some pictures up on uh, Instagram. Kind of clean that off a little bit there. So as you know in the other video, <coughs> I showed how I was doing layout. Let me get ready, make sure the camera's not washing this out. Um, and we tried, and it was something I was I'm like, all right, let's try this. Uh, using the spring calipers. Now, what I noticed was, and you guys saw in the video, and it's something I figured out, uh, I've used that method before for just doing lines like along one edge, you know, and maybe two, but I noticed that the, the wider I got, and especially because of how it's set in the vise, uh, where the jaws were on the front and back, that went rather well because there was a surface to register off of okay so that helped where I ran into trouble was on the sides here where there wasn't a vise jaw or something to register the bottom off of you saw how it started waving and everything so again the lines were just to give me an idea on where to ultimately I went by the dials on my X and Y because they were 500 thousandths apart so what I learned was that that method is okay if you're just doing a couple of relatively close lines and as long as you've got something where one of the legs can register like it did on the vise rather than you know on this side you know here you know I had like a that far and of course you couldn't get the angle so what I learned was for future reference if I want to do that if I'm doing something having the part flat all the way around if you're wanting to do just a quick line or two register marks let's say you want to create a one inch line down a real long piece have your part setting on the table and to where that one leg can register down so it, it's not doing this number which is what was happening on this side and the lines were getting all askew ultimately I went back to and finished marking the others out like you normally do go ahead and I would just do a quick mark and then lay out your square and go ahead and scribe down this was the first one I was doing and I posted pictures but there's a hundred holes there <laughs> the song you know 99 bottles of beer on the wall yeah that crept in so but anyway ultimately we didn't stick exactly with and you can see here the lines are we stuck with once I started off at my I call it my number one hole from that point on everything was 500 thousands get down to the end and five and jump up and just we worked our way in a grid pattern now what I did start off doing was I you know center drill or I spot drill and then put in the change out and put in the drill and then tap and I did that two holes and I went, wait a minute that's gonna take forever so what I changed was I started out with uh, just using the drill bit the size we needed which is a size 25 and I thought well let me just try it because we're not in a hurry we're not let's see if I can get by without spot drilling these because it's just it's soft aluminum it's a small hole and it worked um, with the drill bits I have uh, these were just uh, some normal high-speed steel drill bits I've got a bunch in my Hewitt containers you guys have seen so we did that we went ahead and I just drilled them all first and then I came back and tapped them all and I showed in the video but now that I've got it out because I was going to use a tapping head and I've discussed this before on the small small bits and this idea has been around a long time guys um, but you can easily make okay for your tap with a set screw and this is the other end that was up there this is a half inch piece of material and you can just swap this set screw from here to this end for the larger taps um, I'm not sure exactly I'd have to fill through the box and see what size but you can make these for virtually any size tap you want to use because using a traditional tap handle or T handle can be difficult and trying to center and we're power tapping here uh, for these and it being aluminum and I used a two flute style tap that actually shoved the chip down out of the bottom and we discussed this before so that would be a neat little project to make um, because getting a good purchase on the tap with a chuck it's gonna spin I did I was doing that originally with this good shake it was spinning I'm like wait a minute I dug through my box over there the back one behind me and I've got a bunch of tooling and stuff like that and I would imagine 
that that's a pretty easy project. I've got several of these made up um, that I've acquired over the years, and this is where they come in handy because you tighten that set screw on the flat square portion. You slide it up in there, and it's good. Now, I will note this. What I did experience was in the process of drilling and tapping and up and down, uh, I wasn't paying attention when I got to about the 15th hole, and all of a sudden I went to lift up, and it left the tap in there. So what I started doing to making sure it was tight is about every 10th hole before I went ahead and pulled it out while it was still in there, I'd go ahead, reach around, and just tighten it up to make sure, and I never had any problems after that. So I would recommend that. Um, I have a couple of these to where people made them one-time use deals and they actually brazed them in. Um, so you could do that too, I suppose, but having it to where you can remove it in case you break a tap, I'm lucky I didn't. I was just going slow and easy. Now, I did in the other video, I was doing this at 80 RPM. I thought, wait a minute, this is, I've got to make, and you heard the horrible noise it was making. This has always done it. It's the belt. When you're in back gear running low and you're backing out, you know, it just makes a horrible noise. Uh, now, I went ahead and moved everything up to the next step, which was 135 RPM in back gear a lot quieter way quieter i'm like wow there, there you go so we went ahead plus it made things just go a little faster you know once you get comfortable going through the operations and the motions then i'm like okay you know what i can go ahead and speed up now and i did and so that went a lot quicker i had someone contact me on social media hey how long did it take i guess overall start to finish and we're not even done yet because uh, we're uh deburring and i'm showing you how i'm doing that what i did is on the top since it was still in the vise I used, I'm always talking about my Noga deburr setup. I use this Noga tool, okay? Now, 100 holes is a lot to do, but I wanted to purposely do all the ones on the top by hand, just so I knew that they were a certain dimension. Now on the back, because of how it pushed all of the, you can see the nasty cheese grater, you know, that stuff. So I'm going to show you another way that <coughs> I'm doing it, <coughs> and it's a lot quicker than, and 100 holes is hard on a lot of hands. And so I could have done it on the front, but I thought, okay, I'll do it on the back definitely because some of these don't come off very easily, and it can be somewhat difficult to get some of these to pop off. Now you could, if you have a minion <laughs> or a kid, here, learn how to do and you hand them this and this, and say here you hand that to a 10 year old kid and say here do this help dad out or mom <laughs> there you and they'll be there there use that young energy so me i always like to be able to do things smart and easy and so what we've got set up we've got our albrecht chuck set up here and i'll go ahead and show you guys over here what we have set up and i will zoom let me tighten up the camera so it doesn't fall all right and i will zoom in a little bit and show you what we got all right, and what we're doing. So, we have it in here. We have a counter sink, and I've just got it generally set to where it's open underneath here. And we're just slowly working our way through. And, because we're still in back gear. Oh, there goes that. You heard that. Yeah, phase converter. This thing is on its, I've been, that's the other thing, I've been having to baby, there you heard it on click. Generally I have to just tap it with a hammer. This phase converter is so on its last leg, it's like, man, I hope I win something with the summer batch. So, <clears throat> anyway, that was something else I had to contend with. Um, the, the phase convert, the points in there freezing up. So I had to reach down and tap it, or if you wait a little bit, you hear it on click. So we're in back gear and around 135 RPM. This was the same speed we were tapping. But this is a quick way to deburr a lot of parts if you want to do it. Now you could sit there and hold it and just go like this, which my big thing I'm always worried about is, and I was always taught, if you can, put it in a vise. Now I could, and I'm running slow enough here, I personally feel safe enough because I have to do so many movements instead of cranking and cranking the Z and the X around that I feel safe doing this. Now, if you're not, or it's a really, really small part, by all means, get that down, get it set in the vise. Um, too many times I've seen accidents where people just trying to drill something and they're holding it in their hand and the bit bites, and next thing you know, it comes around and tears your hand up. 
So we're running slow enough here, and I feel comfortable with my with my abilities. Uh, this this I, I think this is safe enough for what I'm doing. And we'll go ahead and get started here. And we're just going to move through and holding it. Kind of let it find its own deal and just. Again, this is the bottom. We're not going very, no particular depth. We're just getting rid of the burr. And it actually goes pretty quick. It's hard to get that in, an all, in this Albrecht chuck, at times it, things want to slip. And I don't use this Albrecht chuck a lot for things that I'm worried about slipping just because it does slip. And I have got it pretty tight in there. Basic chamfer, go through here real quick. Let's see how quick we can do these. Do that up so you guys can see. Back the camera out just a little bit. instead of just holding the part in your hand and pushing it up against the counter seat, I found makes a more even chamfer. Again, this is the bottom. We're not too concerned about looks, but we do want it to be the bird. And honestly, trying to do this many holes by hand, is very, very, very tiring on the arm. You can see how relatively fast we can go through. There we go. Get everything cleaned up. I believe that's all of them. Yep. You've slowly been hacking away at it, and I thought, well, let me video all this. So let me blow this out real quick. Got my air hose. So, looks a lot better, as you can see. Okay. And that's the other side. And we'll, you know, we'll get rid of that with just a little uh, card cleaner. They'll come right off. So nice and clean, already to bird, nice and smooth. So on the other one, what I've been thinking about doing, which I said I am going to do one more just like this, and that is <laughs> it's sitting over here. And you can tell here that the problem I was running into, and this is when I realized trying to use these lines because this is where the vice jaws were is what I was talking about and I ultimately just made a mark and went down with this square again these are just reference I'm still gonna go by the 500,000 increments you know start here work down pull your you know go over here pull your backlash out 
of your machine. So if you're doing that like me, I know I have approximately 50 thousandths backlash between X and Y. And so what I would do is I would get to the end down here, move over and drill. Now before I put, you know, and stop the machine, and what I would do is ever so slightly I'd loosen my nut down on the end uh, for my indicator, loosen it, pull the backlash out, re-zero it to the direction that okay now we're gonna now we're gonna have to pull the part this way to drill and I would do the same thing you know each each way also the same thing when I was I was tapping so that's something to think about as far as uh, steps in the process is before you know you move from here up and same thing when I finally got to the top here uh, and before I started moving back is again pull the backlash out re-zero everything and you know it was 500 thou to each hole so I found it easier just to go back and forth and weave through that worked best for me so if you guys choose to make one of these hopefully that knowledge will help you out um, go ahead and do like a, a traditional I was just trying something new to see how well it worked it did not work that well do your lines do your marks get a square the old traditional way I was just trying to try something new to see if I could do all the lines with a spring caliper worked great for a couple but beyond that you can see where everything and I know when I get in here and drill that these aren't going to match up that's fine these are visual reference marks um, on this one instead of doing or these two and I change the hole settings instead of because these are going to be quarter 20 um, and I'm, I'm not even sure if I'm going to put one at every half inch mark um, because of how the holes are set up uh, I may start off here on the corners and see because these are going to be a, bit, a little bit larger. I don't want to get too many holes with too large of a fastener and then worry about the plate breaking when I go to torque something down or work on it. So obviously these, these are for smaller lighter work so I wasn't too concerned about it but stepping up from a number 10 uh, screw up to a quarter 20 now that's going to be significantly changed although it is half inch aluminum and I'm not going to be trying to hold the world I may go ahead and do it but I'm not going to have them all the way out here on the edge like I did on this fixture but again these are just general use fixture plates and there we go I could suppose put that in a this was a a C grave 50 degree is what that was because I have people ask what kind of flute was that and that's what it was relatively hard to hold on to um, I could put it in you know I could have put this in but you know we got the job done it's not the best in the world for what we're doing here short little production run now if you were running this all day every day you would definitely want to put it in a better quality chuck like I've got a large uh, larger uh, Jacobs Chuck I would definitely put this in and really crank down on that so it wouldn't spin so that was kind of a yeah hey we need to adjust fire on that get it to where it works a little better so <coughs> as far as we've been working on that so I would honestly say from start to finish to do this one plate was about two hours worth of time someone asked and that's just a safe estimate I was stopping and going in among other things so all we have left to do now well, let's just go ahead and do it since we're here. Get it done and quit talking about it. How to get the dicom off, which I like spraying it on the rag, personally, and then come up here and just work it off. That way you're not getting it all over the place too terribly bad, for the most part good thing to have a bunch of old socks and things handy. So looks a lot better with all the little blue marks gone. You can still see the scribe lines, which that's fine. And this was one this one was good enough. Honestly, you could make any side the top or the bottom on this fixture plate. Um, you know and I may go ahead and call this the top and just, you know, it'll work either way. It's that symmetrical. But you can just go through, get all the dicom off instead of spraying the, the carb cleaner everywhere. 
So there we go. Pretty clean. Throw that away. We'll just give it a shot here with a can. Yeah. Still running out of little areas. All right. We'll give it a shot of air here. You know, washing out all the the WD-40 that we used, so it actually came out pretty good. That's the bottom or the top, whatever you go. The the non-mark side, and there's the mark side with all the the scribe lines, and so it looks a lot cleaner. Now let's do the test with the screws. Let's get a 1024. Let's see how well it screws in here by hand, kind of a test. I tested a couple holes when I first started, but let's pick one right here in the middle and see how well. And I'll probably have to go through, just chamfering them. Yeah, there we go. I noticed it was a little difficult at first because from doing the chamfering to kind of rechase the threads, but it moves really, really, really smooth. Okay, we'll do one more over here. So I imagine as, as I put a, you know, let's pick one over here, as I go into the hole for the first time, it trying to, yeah, that one's pretty easy. Same thing going through the bottom. So the first time you use each hole, um, it's trying to retap that thread and using it, I think that turned out pretty good. So I'm pleased with it. First one done in the batch of all the, uh, fixture plates. So there you go. A little close up. So hopefully what I have learned from this, if you guys want to make a fixture plate, <coughs> things that I learned in the process of this that would probably help you guys if you want to make one is if you use some spring calipers for the initial layout that's fine for the first one or two lines. And if you do it and it's not in the vise, make sure you have something where it can rotate. If you're just doing one or two lines, that's fine. Um, what I would recommend, the good old fashioned way, is make each individual mark according to your dimensions, desired dimensions. And where is it? Back here. Back here where I always put it. Go with the square. Lay out. Because remember, we already squared up the sides when we were milling so they fit in the vise. So honestly, go the old traditional method, quicker, faster. I was trying something new. It ended up looking like Fido's butt on the lines. And you know, you can even, I even had to go back and square some up here. You can see, because I did this one with the spring calipers and they weren't lining up. Again, ultimately, these are basic reference marks. We're gonna find our first one and rely on our dials. You get your zeros and move out from there. And I noticed that on some of these lines weren't lining up with the line, which told me, okay, don't trust the lines, trust your dials. Because the lines were, for me, they're more of a visual mark. I'm not gonna follow the lines exactly because there is, I call it human error from you know, your eyes to lining things up. And sometimes when you're doing things, like I marked these other three just sitting on the side of the mill table here. And so there was some movement at times of things. So ultimately, once I started with my first one, rely on your dials. And I know sometimes I repeat myself, guys. I apologize about that. It's just, I wanna make sure that you, the viewer, get the information and I will work better on that. I had someone point that out to me. And I thought, you know, they're absolutely right. Um, but hey, I'm always trying to make better videos each time I do it. So thank you very much. <clears throat> so this will be the last video in the series of the fixture plates. Um, cause I'm not going to show you, you know, I'll show you one later on in another video when they're all done. I'll give you guys a peek and show you what they look like. Um, <clears throat> now I am going to sit down and come up with a design for clamps with these. And I've got a couple of ideas in mind. And that will be a separate series of videos as far as fixture plate clamps. I've got some ideas right now. Um, 
and I want I want to try them out and see what's going to work well because I do want them to have the ability to be uh, somewhat universal. Now, depending on your setup, you might have to have some long screws on one side and shorter ones on the other. And <clears throat> typically, if I have things like that on the larger plates here, that's where the quarter twenty comes in. And I pick quarter twenty because it's very very common. And I've even got some quarter twenty all thread. So theoretically, if you have something that's a real tall part on one side and short on the other, I can put in some all thread and create a clamp however I need to. So again, your imagination, use it. <coughs> all sorts of neat stuff. So thank you for watching guys and gals. Thumbs up, spread the word about my channel. Um, a big thank you again to John Saunders. Really, really enjoyed the open house up there. I had a chance to finally sit down and watch uh, some of the video from that and also from Adam's channel and uh, really really had a good time while I was up there look forward to doing it next year so Bar Z Industrial Summer Bash 2016 I'm gonna sit the link up here you guys I know we're over the 200 people mark and I know Stan was gonna cut it off straight at 300 RSVP Stan now I know he had an issue with his uh, mailbox was full for whatever reason he's fixed that so if you guys have tried to contact him reach out again he's fixed that issue uh, let him know RSVP so we you know how many people's coming we have the prizes uh, a lot of great sponsors a lot of great stuff I'm gonna let him show the stuff that's coming uh, that he's putting out on his channel a lot of great stuff really gonna enjoy it so, my public email address, eagledustoff37 at gmail.com. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, if it's not about this video, about any other subject or tooling I have, or you guys just want to talk about something, I love to hear it. Uh, I'm also on Instagram and Twitter. I post Instagram pictures up. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Spread the word about my channel. And remember, take care of yourself and take care of your family. Because at the end of the day, you and your family is all you got. Until next time. Be safe, get out in the shop, make some chips. This stuff is fun. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.